Hi, welcome to Miss Scott's Reading Time. I'm so glad you could join me. Um, tonight, we're going to be reading the story, Annie and the Old One, by Mishka Miles, and illustrated by Peter Parnall. For this story, I'm not just simply going to read it. Today, I'm going to be modeling a thinking strategy for metacognition. Remember, metacognition is thinking about your thinking. So I'm going to be modeling the strategy of asking questions. Good readers, when they're reading, are always asking questions as they go along. Some of you may have had a teacher who wanted you to stop and jot down questions as you're reading a story or a passage. That is a very good strategy to help you kind of remember what you read about so when you have to go to the questions, you know where to come back to when you're looking for that information. But if that strategy doesn't work for you, just thinking of the questions that you are interested in during the story, that is something that's going to help you be a better reader it's going to help you think more deeply, make more connections to the story. But today, our focus is not just going to be on all of those things, okay? Today, our focus is really going to just be on asking good questions and really wondering what is happening in the story. So anytime you see me stop and say something like, I am wondering or something I want to know about, those are the times when I'm thinking out loud what I'm normally thinking in my head as a good reader. So today I'm going to be modeling Think Aloud for asking questions using this fantastic book, which is one of my favorites, Annie and the Old One. I don't know if you've read this book before, but it is a fantastic book, and I hope you can pick it up at your local library. All right. Annie's Navajo world was good, a world of rippling sand, of high copper red bluffs in the distance, of the low mesa, excuse me, of the low mesa near her own snug Hogan. The pumpkins were yellow in the cornfield and the tassels on the corn were turning brown. And then they give us this picture. Okay. So while I'm reading this book, one of the things I'm wondering about, it says Annie's Navajo World. So I know from my personal experience that Navajo is a tribe of Indians. But then they said her own snug Hogan. And the only thing I see in this picture is something that looks like a house. So maybe I'm wondering if a Hogan is a kind of house because it says the, the high copper, copper red bluffs in the distance the low mesa near her own snug Hogan. And in the background, I can see the mesa and the bluffs, and then I see this rounded building. So I think maybe I'm wondering if that Hogan is what she calls her house. Okay. And it says that the pumpkins were yellow and the tassels were turning brown. So that's kind of giving me an idea about what season it might be. Let's keep reading. Each morning, the gate to the night pen near the Hogan was opened wide and the sheep were herded to pasture on the desert. Annie helped watch the sheep. She carried pails of water to the cornfield and every weekday she walked to the bus stop and waited for the yellow bus that took her to school and brought her home again. So right here next to this picture, I can see that this is the uh, Hogan or the house. And then here's the place where they're coming out of. And she said that it was next to the Hogan. So now my wondering is answered from the page before about how a Hogan must be what she calls her house. So every morning, Annie watches the sheep that have to go out to pasture in the desert on her way to school. Okay. Best of all, there were evenings when she sat at her grandmother's feet and listened to the stories of times long gone. Sometimes it seemed to Annie that her grandmother was her age, a girl who had seen no more than nine or ten harvestings. Harvest. Okay, well, harvestings when they go out and bring in the crops, and I'm guessing they must do that once a year. So Annie must be like nine or ten years old, because I'm guessing they must harvest every year. So sometimes she says her grandmother um, is like a young girl, like her age. Okay, all right. If a mouse skittered and jerked across the hard dirt floor of their Hogan, Annie and her grandmother laughed together. Oh, that's funny. 
And if they prepared the fried bread for the evening meal, if it burnt a little black at the edges, they laughed and said it was good. There were other times when her grandmother sat small and still, and Annie knew that she was very old. Then Annie would cover the thin knees of the old one with a warm blanket. It was at such a time that her grandmother said, It is time you learn to weave, my granddaughter. Hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if the old one is what they call the grandmother, because it says there were times when her grandmother was small, and she sat very still, and she was old. And then Annie would cover the thin knees of the old one with a warm blanket. And old one is capitalized. You see right here, it's capitalized. So that tells me that that must be the name of someone. And since everything is talking about her grandmother, I'm wondering if the old one refers to her grandmother. And then this is a picture of her grandmother. And sometimes she thought she was like a young girl, probably because they laughed and did funny stuff together. And then other times, grandmother was very still and quiet. And so that made her feel like grandmother was very old. And now she has to learn to weave. Hmm, that sounds like a fun thing. Annie touched the web of wrinkles that crisscrossed her grandmother's face and slowly went outside the Hogan. Yep, there we go. The Hogan must be their house. And then there's the grandmother and Annie touching her face. Annie looks very young, so maybe she's not a 9 or 10. Maybe, um... Maybe they harvest twice a year, so maybe she's like five. Hmm, I don't know, I'm, I don't know. Let's keep reading. Beside the door, her father sat cross-legged, working with silver and fire and making a handsome heavy necklace. Annie passed him and went to the big room where her mother sat weaving. Annie sat beside the loom, watching, while her mother slid the weaving stick in place among the strings of the warp. With red wool, her mother added a row to the slanting arrow of red, bright against the dull background. Annie's thoughts wandered. She thought about the stories her grandmother had told. Stories of hardship when rains flooded the desert, of dry weather when rains did not fall and the pumpkins and the corn were dry in the field. Annie looked out across the sand where the cactus bore its red fruit and thought about the coyote, God's dog, guarding the scattered hogans of the Navajos. Hmm. I wonder hmm, why she wasn't scared of coyotes. I would be scared of coyotes. But here's a picture for Father Carving and her mother and she watching her mother weave on the loom. Hmm. Annie watched while her mother worked. She made herself sit very still. After a time, her mother looked at her and smiled. Are you ready to weave, my daughter? Annie shook her head. She continued to watch while her mother twisted the weaving stick in the warp, making a shed for the strands of gray and red wool. At last, her mother said softly, You may go, as almost though she knew what Annie wanted. Annie ran off to find her grandmother, and together they gathered twigs and brush to feed the fire in the middle of the Hogan. What? They have a fire in the middle of their house? Huh. Well, I guess that makes sense they didn't have electricity, so it makes sense that they would have a fire, but still seems so strange. But I guess this is part of their culture, that they would have a fire in the middle of the Hogan, and that's why they have the hole in the top, so that the smoke can get out. Well, okay, that totally makes sense. Um, when the evening meal was done, the old grandmother called all of the family together. Annie and her mother and father stood quietly and respectfully waiting for grandmother to speak. A coyote called shrilly from the mesa, but there was no sound in the Hogan, no sound at all, except the small snap of the dying fire. Then the grandmother spoke softly. My children, when the new rug is taken from the loom, I will go to Mother Earth. Annie shivered and looked at her mother. Her mother's eyes were shining bright with tears that did not fall, and Annie knew what her grandmother meant. Her heart stood still, and she made no sound. The old one spoke again. 
You will each choose the gift you wish to have. Annie looked at the hard earth swept smooth and clean. What will you have, my granddaughter? The grandmother asked. Annie looked at a weaving stick propped against the wall of the Hogan. This was the grandmother's own weaving stick, polished and beautiful with age. Annie looked directly at the stick. As though Annie had spoken, her grandmother nodded. My granddaughter shall have my weaving stick. Okay, this is a very sad page, and it makes me have lots of questions. I don't know too much about Navajo culture, but I know that um, the older people of the tribe um, of Native Americans would um, be considered very uh, respected, and that they anything that they said would be followed through with and that when she said she will go to Mother Earth that that was her way of saying that she will pass away when the rug is taken from the loom so she knows that she is not well and that she will die soon and that she's giving away things that mean something to her to the people who mean something to her giving things to them that mean something to her. And so I guess Annie has chosen the weaving stick, even though she doesn't yet know how to weave. Boy, that's sad. On the floor of a Hogan lay a rug that the old one had woven long, long ago. The colors were mellowed, and its warp and weft were strong. Annie's mother chose the rug. Annie's father chose a silver belt studded with turquoise that was loose around the waist of the old one. Annie folded her arms tightly across her stomach and went outside, and her mother followed her. How can my grandmother know she will go to Mother Earth when the rug is taken from the loom? Annie asked. Many of the old ones know, her mother said. How do they know? Your grandmother is one of those who live in harmony with all nature, with earth, coyote, birds in the sky. They know more than many will ever learn. Those old ones know, her mother sighed deeply. We will speak of other things. So I guess Annie has lots of questions about why grandmother knows this, and the mother says she just knows because people who are older just know stuff, and Annie doesn't understand because she's a kid, and she has lots of questions. So the mother just changes the subject and says, we will speak of other things. In the days that followed, the grandmother went about her work much as she had always done. She ground corn to make meal for bread, she gathered dry twigs and brush to make fire, and when there was no school, she and Annie watched the sheep and listened to the sweet, clear music of the bell on the collar of the lead goat. The weaving of the rug was high on the loom, and it was almost as high as Annie's waist. My mother, Annie said, why do you weave? I weave so that we may sell the rug and buy the things we must need from the trading post, silver for silver making, deer hide for boots. But you know what grandmother said? Annie's mother did not speak. She slid her weaving stick through the warp and picked up a strand of rose red wool. Annie turned away and ran. She ran across the sand and huddled in the shallow shade of the small mesa. Her grandmother would go back to the earth when the rug was taken from the loom. The rug must not be finished. Her mother must not weave. The next morning, where her grandmother went, Annie followed. Hmm. I understand why the mother needs to weave, because they need the money to buy the things. And not weaving, Annie wants her not to weave, because she doesn't want anything to happen to grandmother. So I'm wondering why, I don't know. I'm wondering so many things, but yet I can't find a word to say. I guess I'll just keep reading. When it was time to go to the bus stop to meet the school bus, she dawdled, walking slowly and watching her feet, and perhaps she would miss the bus. Then quite suddenly, she didn't want to miss it. Perhaps she knew what she must do. She ran hard, as fast as she could, breathing deeply, and the yellow bus was waiting for her at the stop. She climbed aboard, and the bus moved on, stopping now and then at the Hogan's along the way. Annie sat there alone and made a plan. In school, she would be bad so bad that the teacher would send for her mother and father. And if her mother and father came to school to talk to the teacher, that would be one day the mother couldn't weave. One day. On the playground, Annie's teacher was in charge of the girls' gym class. Who will lead exercises today? The teacher asked. No one answered. 
The teacher laughed very well, then I shall be the leader. The teacher was young and had yellow hair. Her blue, skirt, her blue skirt was wide and the heels on her brown shoes were high, so the teacher kicked off her shoes and all the girls laughed. Annie followed the teacher's lead, bending and jumping and doing all kinds of exercises. And she waited for the time when the teacher would lead them in jogging on the playground. Annie jogged past the spot where the teacher's shoes were laying on the ground. She picked up a shoe and hid it in the folds of her dress. When Annie jogged past a trash can, she dropped the shoe inside. Oh my word. This seems like a big thing to do here. I am wondering why Annie would go to such drastic measures. I mean, I know she loves her grandmother and everything, but seriously, throwing away your teacher's shoe? That's a big deal. Oh, Annie, no, don't do it. Some of the girls saw her and laughed. The some frowned and were solemn. When the line jogged near the schoolhouse door, Annie slipped from the line and went into her room and sat at her desk. Clearly, she heard the teacher as she spoke to the girls outside. The other shoe, please. Her voice was pleasant and then there was silence. Limping, one shoe on and one shoe gone, the teacher came into the room. The girls all followed, giggling and holding their hands across their mouths. I know it's funny, said the teacher, but now I need my shoe. Annie looked at the boards of the floor. A shiny black beetle crawled in between the cracks. The door opened and a man teacher came inside with a shoe in his hand. As he passed Annie's desk, he touched her shoulder and smiled down at her. I saw someone playing tricks, he said. The teacher looked at Annie and the room was very still. When the school was over for the day, Annie waited. Timidly, with a hammering heart, she went to the teacher's desk. Do you want my mother and father to come to the school tomorrow? She asked. No, Annie, the teacher said. I have the shoe. Everything is all right. Annie's face was hot and her hands were cold. She turned and ran. She was the last to climb on the bus. Finally, there was her own bus stop. She hopped down and slowly trudged the long way home. She stopped beside the loom. The rug was now much higher than her waist. Her plan didn't work, so I don't know what Annie's going to do now because she tried to get herself in trouble at school and it didn't work. So I don't know what she's going to do now, but she doesn't seem excited about going home. And now the rug is even taller than her waist. Not a good sign. The night she curled up in the blanket and she slept lightly. She awakened just before dawn. There was no sound from her mother's sheepskin. Her grandmother was a quiet hump in the blanket and Annie only heard her father's loud, sleeping breathing. There was no other sound on the whole earth except for the howling of a coyote from far across the desert. There's Annie sleeping. In the dim light of early morning, Annie crept outside to the night pen where the sheep were sleeping. The dry wood creaked when she opened the gate and pushed it wide open against the fence. She tugged at the sleeping sheep until one stood quietly, then the others also uncertain, shoving together. The lead goat turned towards the open gate and Annie slipped her fingers through his belled collar. She curled his fingers up across the bell, muffling its sound, and led the goat through the gate. The sheep followed. She led them across the sand and around the small mesa where she released the goat. Go, she said. Okay, this is a terrible idea. I don't know why Annie would do this. This is not going to keep um, grandmother around and it's not going to be good for her. She's letting the lead goat out who's going to lead all the sheep. Then they're all going to be lost and that is really bad for the farm. This is a bad idea, Annie. A very bad idea. She went back to the Hogan and slid it under her blanket and lay shivering. Now her family would have to hunt for the sheep all day, and this could be a day when her mother didn't weave. Now I know that she has this plan, but I think that it's going to not be a good one. When the fullness of morning came and it was light, Annie watched her grandmother rise and go outside. Annie heard her call. The sheep are gone! Annie's mother and father hurried outside and Annie followed. Her mother moaned softly. The sheep! The sheep! I see them, grandmother said. They grazed near the mesa. Annie went with her grandmother, and when they reached the sheep, Annie's fingers slipped under the goat's collar, and the bell tingled sharply as the sheep 
followed back to the pin. So our plan once again didn't work. In school that day, Annie sat quietly and wondered what more she could do. When the teacher asked questions, Annie looked at the floor. She didn't even hear. Oh, Annie, you gotta pay attention in school. What is happening? When the night came, she curled up in her blanket, but not to sleep. When everything was still, she slipped from her blanket and crept outside. Oh, no. What is Annie going to do now? Every time we turn around, she is doing something to try to keep the rug from being finished so that she can keep grandmother around. And I understand. I've lost my grandmother, and it was devastating. I cannot imagine what Annie is thinking and going through, especially being so young. But at the same time, she just keeps trying to get in trouble, and this is very bad. The sky was dark, and the wind was soft against her face, and for a moment she stood waiting until she could see in the night, and she went to the loom. Oh, Annie, no! She felt for the weaving stick in its place among the warp strings, and she separated the warp and felt for the wool. Slowly, she pulled out the strands of, the strands of yarn one by one, one by one, she laid them across her knees, and when the row was removed, she separated the strings of the warp again and reached for a second row. When the, ro when the woven rug was only as high as her waist, she crept back to her blanket, taking the strands of wool with her. Under her blanket, she smoothed the strands and made them into a ball, and then she slept. So she thinks if she takes the strings of wool out of the rug, then it won't get finished. Oh, Annie, this is a terrible idea. The next night, Annie removed another day's weaving, and in the morning, when her mother went to the loom, she looked puzzled. For a moment, she pressed her fingers against her eyes. The old one looked at Annie curiously. Annie held her breath. On the third night, Annie crept to the loom. A gentle hand touched her on the shoulder. Go to sleep, my granddaughter, the old one said. Annie wanted to throw her arms around her grandmother's waist and tell her why she'd been bad, but she could only stumble to her blanket, huddle under it, and let the tears roll into the edge of her hair. I don't think she really needed to tell the old one why she was doing it. Grandmother knew it because they were so close. She knows why she's doing it, but she knows that she doesn't need to do it. When the morning came, Annie unrolled herself from the blanket and helped prepare the morning meal. Afterward, she followed her grandmother through the cornfield. Her grandmother walked slowly, and Annie fitted her steps in the slow steps of the old one. When they reached the small mesa, the old one sat crossing her knees, folded her gnarled fingers into her lap, and Annie knelt beside her. The old one looked far off towards the rim of the desert where the sky met the sand. My granddaughter, she said, you have tried to hold back time. This cannot be done. The desert stretched yellow and brown away to the edge of the morning sky. The sun comes up from the edge of the earth in the morning. It returns to the edge of the earth in the evening. Earth from which good things come for the living creatures in it. Earth to which all creatures finally go. Annie picked up a handful of brown sand and pressed it against the palm of her hand. Slowly, she let it fall to earth. She understood many things. The sun rose, but it also set. The cactus didn't bloom forever. Petals dry and fell to earth. She knew that she was part of the earth and the things on it. She would always be a part of the earth just as her grandmother had always been. Just as her grandmother would always be. Always and forever and Annie was breathless with the wonder of it. I think it's good that Grandmother had this talk with her, because I'm, I'm sure Annie was wondering why Grandmother, you know, has to go. She wants her to stay. Grandmother's just such a close friend of her. She loves her so much. She doesn't want Grandmother to go, but Grandmother is very wise, and the old one told her, this is why this must be, and Annie finally understood, and I think that's good. They walked back to the Hogan together, Annie and the old one. Annie picked up the old weaving stick. I'm ready to weave, she said to her mother. 
I'm going to use the stick that my grandmother has given me. She knelt at the loom beside her mother. She separated the warp strings and slipped the weaving streak stick in place as her mother had done and as her grandmother had done before her. She picked up a strand of gray wool and started to weave. The end. I do have some questions about weaving and how they make rugs and what looms are, but I don't think it took away from the story that I don't know those things. I think this was a really good message to um, help kids understand accepting losing somebody that they really care about, but at the same time um, being respectful and remembering them and what an impact they had upon them. And I think Annie finally embracing taking the weaving stick that grandmother had used many, many, many years before was a definite sign of respect and a sign of acceptance of her realizing that even if grandmother were gone, the old one would always be with her in her heart and in her memories and in that weaving stick that she had used for many, many years. So it's a very good story. So if you enjoyed reading this book, you can check it out, Annie and the Old One by Mishka Miles. It was one of the um, wonderful Newbery Honor Award books from long ago. So thank you for joining me. Bye.